welcome back to another video. Uh, today is a new project that we're starting. Uh, as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Corey. The one and only. Um, I had this opinion while cleaning my office one day. And it's not really an opinion, it's just a fact, basically. The Maritimes do not have a Hall of Fame. If they do, I don't know about it. So it's not well known. So, I sh shot message, a message to Corey and I was like, you want to do a Hall of Fame for the Maritimes? And he was like, nah. <laughs> <laughs> nah, not interested. Um, of course I said yes. Of course he said yes. Otherwise, we wouldn't be doing this video. And the wrestler that came up in both of our minds uh, is the clear number one choice to be going into for the first inductee. I think we're going to call it the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Or the Wall of Fame. The Wall of Fame. We're going to basically do... Um, we're going to take a picture... And for the picture that Joel's going to use here is going to be the picture of our first inductee. And for our first class, then we're going to combine all the pictures and make one huge picture with all the guys. And it's just an, an opinion thing on us. It's basically highlighting these guys, uh, giving them a shout out. Maybe there are names that you've forgotten about. Maybe there are names that you are really familiar with. But this is us paying tribute to the heroes of maritime wrestling. So, the first guy going in. I'm sure some of you have already guessed it, because how c would Maritime Wrestlings exist without this person? No. Um, this person has had a touch on so many people's careers in the Maritimes. Mm -hmm. We will get into that in just a little bit. But the first inductee is none other than René Dupré and Jeff Dupré's father, Émile Dupré himself. The golden boy. Um, Émile Dupré... Uh, born in on October 20th, 1936. He is the father, he has eight kids apparently. Eight kids, yeah. Of Jeff, which we know as Spider-Man that wrestled for Grand Prix. And uh, Rene Dupree that we've all seen on WWE. He's been in Japan, he's been all over the world really. Um, and his ring names were Emile Dupree or Emile Gauguin. Yeah, Gauguin is his actual last name. Yeah. Yeah, like René Dupree is not Dupree. He's yeah, René Gauguin. It's, it's, it's a pseudonym. Um, trained by Vic Butler and Reggie Richards. Uh, he started his career in Boston. Yep. Uh, so he is born in the Maritimes, I believe so, right? I would assume yeah. so. <laughs> um, he wrestled all over the world, Australia, New Zealand, in the States. Uh, he wrestled in Stampede Wrestling. Uh, in the early days, um, but he is probably more known for starting Atlantic Grand Prix Wrestling. The way he got into wrestling is he was actually going to college. Yes. And he decided to drop out of college, and uh, he got introduced to Vic and Reggie mm -hmm. through bodybuilding, I believe yep. it was. And he decided that he wanted to be trained for wrestling. Mm -hmm. uh, his career of wrestling spans from 1955 all the way to 1988 yep. as a wrestler. As a wrestler. And those last, in the 80s especially, it would be a match here and a match there. He yeah, was already Very far and in between. Um, how Grand Prix got started. So a lot of people don't know this. Uh, in the 60s, in the 50s and 60s, I believe, there was a promoter called Cowboy Len Hughes. Yep. So Cowboy Mike Hughes, Emil gave him the name Cowboy Mike Hughes as a tribute to Len Hughes. Len Hughes was, um, he was an American, and he came to the Maritimes, did a few shows. There's no territory in the Maritimes, so let's have a territory in the Maritimes and I'll run it. But Len Hughes was also uh, an uneducated man. Could not, read, could, could not read, could not write. So the story is that Emil was uh, basically <coughs> Len's right-hand man, and he was the, the paperwork guy. And Emil basically thought, you know, I'm doing all the work anyway. So in a very sneaky way, Len knew he he could he knew how to write his own name. That's it. So Emil 
made some documents and said, Len, sign this. Len signed it, signing the territory to Emil Dupree. And that's how Atlantic Grand Prix Wrestling got started. Wow. Yeah. Um... That was in what, 1977? It was in 1960. It was in the early 60s because the earliest card that I found for Atlantic Grand Prix Wrestling is 1961, but it's unofficial. Grand Prix is one of those promotions where you find a lot of question marks. Uh, A lot of question marks on title reigns, when it started, when the last show was. But uh, in the 60s, Another big draw for that really got success going for Emil and Grand Prix Wrestling was bringing in um, Yvon Durel. Now, for old school boxing fans, you'll know he challenged for the World Light Heavyweight Championship against Archie Moore, the old mongoose himself. And that match he would have won too, right? He would have won with some rules of current boxing. Yeah. Uh, The three knockdown rules because he knocked him down like three or four times in, like, one of the opening rounds. And he would have also knocked him out if he would have just backed up back into his yes. corner. So, uh, he should have won, but he didn't. Yeah. Uh, after boxing, he did wrestling. And uh, he and uh, Rin- and Emil were, like, the two top stars, the two top baby faces of Atlantic Grand Prix Wrestling in the 60s, uh, feuding with the likes of The Beast and uh, Rudy K. So, um, uh, the Beast and Rudy K were also, like, big names. The Cormier brothers. Uh, the other two brothers were, uh, Bobby K and the great Leo Burke. Yep. Um, throughout Emma's career, he also faced, like, many different legends as we know today. Oh, yeah. Uh, just to name a few here, the likes of, like, Killer Kowalski and mm-hmm. Dusty Rhodes and Cuban Assassin and, um, can you think of other, well... Yeah, Harley Race. Harley I Race. Um, he yeah. has he ever faced Flair? Because I know Flair came down quite a bit. Flair might have been after his time. I think Flair would have faced like a Leo Burke or a okay. guy like that, maybe in the uh, big Stephen Pettipot or something like that. I think Flair. By the time Flair is the world champion in the early eighties, um, he's pretty much done. And when he faced Dusty Rhodes, this is before. American Dream. This we're talking about young Dusty Rhodes, yeah. who was with the Texas Outlaws with the Dick uh, Murdoch. But uh, Emil, he he forms a partnership in the seventies with another Grand Prix wrestling, Grand Prix wrestling out of Quebec, Quebec which yeah. which is the uh, Vachons, Mad Dog and Paul the Butcher Vachon. Um, the they're on YouTube. There are two videos. One of them, and they're both from Quebec, they're known as International Grand Prix Wrestling. I think it was just Grand Prix Wrestling back then. Uh, you see Emil in a match, and it's one of the only matches I've found with Emil Dupree in it. Um, I showed this to my mom, and even like he, they're against the UFO, which was a gimmick in Atlantic Grand Prix Wrestling. Um, she's like, oh, that guy, that guy. She remembered all of them. She was a little girl when that was happening. But they, they uh, swapped talent, including um, the Grand Prix Tag Team Champions, Gino Brito and Dino Bravo, one season in 70, 73 or 74. They came down and they were defending the titles, and it's the Grand Prix Tag Team Championship, so nobody's none the wiser. Yeah, because how would you know, right? Yeah. Two, com- two promotions people called Grand Prix. Yeah, but we've been talking about Grand Prix, and... The one thing that needs to be said is Atlantic Grand Prix Wrestling is a national treasure. Yeah. For the maritime people, you they say they say Grand Prix, Grand Prix, Grand Prix Wrestling, Grand Prix, not even wrestling, wrestling. just Grand Prix, Grand Prix, and they'll always say Killer Carl Krupp. Yep. Carl Krupp was uh, another guy that came in for Grand Prix. Was another rival of Emil. You have to mention the crop of talent from the 70s to the 80s and even very very early 90s that Emil got for Grand Prix Wrestling because it really being Maritimers me and you 
if we would have been born in there, that's the only wrestling we're getting. Yeah, if we would have been born, you know, 30, 40 years earlier. <laughs> yeah. Um, there were other companies. The Cormiers had the ESA in uh, Nova Scotia. And uh, then there was international wrestling, and there was trans-Canadian wrestling and all that. But uh, Emil had, uh, in the 80s, he started... Grand Prix got TV in 1973. And it was on TV for seventy for seventy what? For seventeen years. Seventy years. <laughs> seventy years. Still We're going still on. on TV today. <laughs> um, a lot of that is lost. Um, in the late seventies, Emil brokered a deal with Angelo Poffo and his two sons. You might have heard of them. The Macho Man. And Leaping and Lanny Poffo. The genius. The genius of glory and renown. Uh, all three are passed on now. Lanny just died this year, unfortunately. Uh, an R.I.P. to him. But um, Grand Prix Wrestling, like we're talking a lot about other guys. This was Emil's baby. Oh yeah. This was the Maritime Territory. He got burned out. The territories were dying out. Uh, his hot star was aging, which is Leo Burt. Uh, his number two guy. Uh, arguably there could have been a, a few number two guys uh, the Beast who was even older and then there's Big Steve and Pettipa they're all by 1990 they're it's getting long in the tooth yeah. Atlantic Grand Prix Wrestling changes its name to World Grand Prix Wrestling in 87 in 1990 they have their final season um, Big Steven and uh, Al Zink they continue the Maritime Territory in 91 and in 92 as Maritime Championship Wrestling and Canadian Championship Wrestling. In 93, there is no territory in the Maritimes. Wrestling is so done at this point. The big golden era boom of the WWF is done. We're heading into the new generation. Wrestling is struggling. The steroid scandal and all that. Wrestling ain't cool anymore. Attitude era starts. 1996, a young Rene Dupree says, Papa, I would like to wrestle, please. <laughs> so, Emil starts the territory back. He... Sort of a sad and unreal uh, thing to, to hear about was he was going to bring, bring in Bulldog Bob Brown as his booker. So, Emil was going to train a few guys, which included uh, his son, Rene Dupree, uh, Cowboy Mike Hughes, uh, Wild Man Gary Williams, uh, Brody Steele, a um, few other guys, I think, but those were like the, the big names from that class. Uh, Bobby Roode came down from Ontario for the cards and all that. We had Edge and Christian. Christian came in. We had, had Kurgan. Kurgan was later on. Yeah. Um, around 99 when he got re released by the WWF. Um, but like Rick Martell, Bad News Allen, Don Callis, they, Scott Demore, all wrestled that first year in 97. Bulldog Bob Brown was going to be the booker. A month before they start, massive heart attack and dies. Jeez. So he brings in Hustler Rip Rogers, who was technically the last international heavyweight champion in Grand Prix wrestling history. Uh, Emil had a weird way of talking, so he talked like this, uh, in the WF, they have, uh, they have the Steve Austin and the Mark Merrill. So, Wild Man Gary Williams, his first gimmick was Wild Man Austin. A take on Wild Man Mark Merrill and Stone Cold Steve Austin. Um, this second boom period for Grand Prix was never televised. The few videos there are was recorded by New Scott. There's one actually from July 99, July 23rd, 1999 to be precise, on my birthday. Um, that's like the one... Vi I remember watching like edging Christian matches. Like there, were, there was one big Grand Prix and it was like Grand Prix Wrestling 1997, edging Christian... Don Callis, Rick Martell. They had a bunch of names in the thumbnail, too. But, um... Rene, by 2001, gets signed by WWE. Uh, obviously, he's 
didn't have a very long career with WWE. No, and as soon as he went to the WWE, Emil's like, done. Territory's done. I completely understand, though. He did that for his son. Yeah, and... Yeah, if son, his son not being there anymore. Plus, you had competition like Real Action Wrestling. Mainstream wrestling was a big thing at that time. Uh, Atlantic Coast Wrestling was starting up, which was a no-class Bobby Bass's promotion. And he poached Brody Steele, for some reason, from Real Action Wrestling, uh, who was wrestling as Kingman at the time. Um, but there was plenty of wrestling in the Maritime, but once again, it was a short boom period. By like 2004, the only promotion left is mainstream wrestling, and they're performing in Dooley's bars and in Halifax, and we're not really getting much over here. But 2005, his other son, Jeff, decides he wants to wrestle. So there's this fourth, this third incarnation of Grand Prix wrestling. Uh, this is where Titus, Julian Young, Marcus Burke, uh, BT Bobby Man, uh, a lot of these guys Nick got Teeth. trained. Nick Teeth. Uh, who else do I have written down here? Obviously, Jeff and Renee. Uh, your Canadian Idol. That's right. That's right. Uh, Chris Charters. Yep. Um, this this was uh, basically to do the same. Jeff basically saw what Renee was doing and was like, I want a piece of that pie. But he wasn't meant for it. No. Um, he was their champion, which was the old uh, North American tag belt, which uh, I marked out the first time I saw that. But once Jeff decided I'm done, which was in 2008, uh, Emil was done with wrestling for good. And the storied legacy of Emil Dupree finally came to an end. Um, I think he will be remembered more as a promoter than a wrestler. Yeah, yeah. Because, as a wrestler, there's so little out there. Yeah, I had to scrounge up, I think, like, five or six different websites to find, like, I have these stats here and stuff that what of, of what I could find, we'll go through that in a minute there, but it's so hard to find stuff on... Yeah, and the stats, it's what they knew. Yeah. There might be stuff missing, but this is what Joel has found, so the floor is yours. 1956. He had a total of 36 matches, 17 wins, 13 losses, 6 draws. Okay. 57. Total of 40 matches, 14 wins, 12 losses, 14 uh, draws. Wow. 58. 41 matches, 13 wins, 17 losses, 11 draws. And back in the day, wrestling had a lot of draws. Because it's a way to not lose. Yeah. 59. He had 36 matches, 12 wins, 15 losses, 9 draws. 1960, 33 matches, 11 wins, 12 losses, 10 draws. 1961, 54 matches, 18 wins, 26 losses, 10 draws. 62, 38 matches, 10 wins, 23 losses, 5 draws. 63, 46 matches, 15 wins, 21 losses, 10 draws. 64, 75 matches, 39 wins, 27 losses, 9 draws. Uh, 1965 is the year with the most matches I could find. It said he had a total of 91 matches, 46 wins, 28 losses, 17 draws. Wow. 66, 43 matches, 17 wins, 20 losses, 6 draws. 67, 27 matches, 7 wins, 18 losses, 2 draws. 1968, 15 matches, 8 wins, 4 losses, 3 draws. This is where it starts coming down a lot. Yeah. Uh, 69, nice. <laughs> 16 matches, 2 wins, 11 losses, 3 draws. 1970, for some reason, 57 matches. 28 wins, 25 losses, 4 draws. 71, he only had 9 matches. 5 wins, 2 losses, 2 draws. Uh, 72, 11 matches, 3 wins, 6 losses, 2 draws. 73, 18 matches, 8 wins, 9 losses, 1 draw. 74, 8 matches, 6 wins, 1 loss, 1 draw. 75, couldn't find a thing about it. Wow. 76, he had four matches, one win, three losses, no draws. Okay. So first year that he doesn't have a draw. Yeah. Uh, 77, couldn't find anything. 78, three matches, two wins, one loss. No draws. No draws. 79, three matches, 
three wins. Undefe- this year yet? <laughs> undefeated. 100%. <coughs> 1980. Four matches, three wins, one loss. The next thing I could find was 1988. Wow. Two matches, two wins. For a total of 706 matches, 280 wins, 295 losses, and 131 draws. So he has more losses than wins. He is in the losing column. Wow. As a wrestler. But he is the legendary maritime hero. He, He's Emil Dupree. If it wouldn't have been for Emil Dupree... Maritime wrestling probably wouldn't exist to this day. I think there would have been some form of maritime wrestling, but Emil, uh, someone had to do it and it was him. Yeah. Simple as that. Um, I want to personally thank Emil Dupree and the Dupree family for all the years that you gave my family because when I would watch my heroes growing up, like the Ultimate Warrior and Macho Man Randy Savage in Demolition. I would always have family members saying, ah, that Grand Prix wrestling was better. I remember stories of my grandparents and stuff being like, yeah, back in my day, Ric Flair came to the Rishabuktu Arena. Mm-hmm. Crazy to think that your NWA World Champion would come to the Rishabuktu Arena. Yeah, a, a, a town of, I think, like 1,200 people now, in this day. And that day would have been way less than what it was. Mm-hmm. And uh, Macho Man Randy Savage, my mom telling me stories of watching Randy and Lanny going balls to the wall in Rishibuktu. Like diving off the ropes of the concrete. Like, Someone else that we haven't mentioned that was there was the Bushwhackers. Bushwhackers uh, were there. The uh, Sheepers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Edge as Sexton Hardcastle. Christian Cage. Christian uh, Cage. I could be wrong. I feel like Rhino made a tour as um, Rhino Richards. Someone else we didn't mention too, Dynamite Kid. Dynamite Kid came over at the tail end of his career, was the international heavyweight champion, Harley Race. Harley Race. Uh, at the end of his career. So this would have been in 1989. Because I am... When I'm born, it's in the middle of the season in 1988, in July 1988. And my uncle used to tell me, you, I would go watch Grand Prix with you. So the way it would work, on Saturday afternoons there would be a Grand Prix show and there would be a WWF show or vice versa. And my uncle, when I was a kid, would tell me, he told me this a few times, now I ask him this, I don't know if he's losing his mind or what, but he doesn't recall anything. But as a kid, he told me this. So I'd always pick his brain about Grand Prix because I always wanted to know about new wrestling. He told me, when I would go watch it with you, Dynamite Kid was the champion, and Leo Burke and Bobby Kay were the tag team champions. Now, could he have just said that? But doing my research makes sense. Dynamite Kid was the international heavyweight champion in 1989 when I was a year old. Uh, in 1989, like I say, yeah. Uh, Leo and Bobby, Bobby K, were the tag team champions in 1990 when I was two, in the final season. So, technically speaking, I did see some Grand Prix live. <coughs> Do I remember it? Fuck no. Well, you've seen Grand Prix live, just not not the original, not the original, or remembered it. Because there's one tour we haven't talked about either. That one had nothing to do with Emil. No, Renee's the one that booked that one. Uh, the 2013 to 17 tour, uh, which featured the Great Muda. The Great Muda. <laughs> Sonata. Sonata. Uh, uh, Tokyo Inabe, or I don't know his other name. Yasafumi Nakawe too. Yeah, Nasafumi. Um, uh, Aaron Angel. Aaron Angel. What was the? <coughs> Shinene. There was another guy, the Chinese guy. Yasafumi? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, <coughs> older guy. Oh, uh, I know who you're talking about there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Kwong. Kwang. Uh, Kwong. Kwong. Uh, yeah. <coughs> yeah, but y- y- you're getting it. Yeah, yeah. Something Kwong. Or... Yeah. 
Wang Wang. Or... Anyway, he was there too. Uh, <coughs> Hannibal. Hannibal. Hannibal from the Hannibal TV uh, with his Bobby like, Sharp, Jeremy Bobby Prophet. Sharp, yeah, Bobby. Those are the guys that I first saw there. So, Marcus Burke during Marcus the Burke. Tough Enough. Did he go? Yeah, he made an appearance. Uh, not too long after he sent his tape. Okay. Uh, the good old classic Spider-Man. <laughs> uh, but without Grand Prix, Re- Grand Prix Wrestling, with all the promotions we have right now, uh, they all have to thank their bottom dollar that North Pro- that North Pro- that Grand Prix was uh, was around when it was around. In grand total, it went for twenty nine years, maybe more, maybe less, depending. There's that question mark. But the earliest card was 1961, and they ended in 1990. Came back in 97 to 2001, ended 2005, 2008, ended 2013 to 2017. Will we see it again? We're hopeful. Uh, probably not. Uh, probably not, but we're hopeful. Uh, yeah, I wish... I would like Renee to bring it back for a few tours. But that was our little tribute to the first ever inductee into the Jolteon Plays Presents <coughs> Wrestling with the Bros Hall of Fame. Welcome to the wall, Emil Dupree. I'll be posting a video, obviously, of just... I, I may make a short with it. Just first induction. First inductee. Bam! Emil. And I have him with a championship. I have belt. a full empty wall there, too. Yeah. That works. Yeah. So... That was the first inductee. Um, leave a like on the video. Uh, we can do more maritime wrestling classics. Uh, this is going to be... <coughs> <coughs> Sorry there. Just getting over a cold. Uh, we're going to be doing a multi-part series of this. Mm-hmm. <coughs> Holy shoot. Um, we don't know exactly how many we'll have in our first class. Uh, We're looking at maybe four or five. Yeah. We don't want to go too big, too fast, and then we'll do multiple classes, obviously, just like WWE's one class a year, but we'll do one class divided into multiple videos, yeah. do a history of that person in each video. Um, leave us some comments on your thoughts and opinions, and who do you think should be in our Hall of Fame? I would love to hear your thoughts and opinions on... Glove. <laughs> Uh, on who you think should be inducted. Um, don't take it personally if we don't have your pick in, obviously. Uh, it might be someone that's coming eventually. Uh, we're also not going to be doing someone that's like not retired yet. Yeah. So, like for example, we won't be doing Dylan Davis because yeah. he's still currently wrestling. So it's going to have to be someone that's retired or passed away or just not in the wrestling business anymore yeah and subscribe to the channel if you have not already uh some great things coming up uh i'm looking forward to finish the rest of the series me too and we'll catch you in the next one peace take care